just the fact that we've grown free up is pretty relevant. I mean, we bootstrapped it with $2,000. We did about a million dollars in the first year, 5 million last year, and between seven and 10 this year. And that's pretty much everything organic. We didn't really do paid ads until about a year ago. This is Local SEO Tactics, where each week we're bringing you tips and tricks to help you get found online. And this week we got a pretty cool episode. We're going to be interviewing Nate Hirsch of FreeUp.com. Nate is the founder and CEO of FreeUp, and he's going to help us break down some areas that you, as local business owners and managers, and can bring in some temporary talent to help you free yourself up. Um, some great tips, some great advice on how to not be the superman or the superwoman of your organization trying to do everything at once, and how you can bring on some temporary or even long-term work uh, to help in some specialized areas to really, again, free you up. So uh, take some notes. Hopefully this guy helps you out. If you want to learn more about freeup.com and how it can benefit you, uh, Nate's got a pretty cool offer for us. Check out the show notes, and we've got a link to it here to give you some free resources and some free guides and uh, and a great offer for you to get started on freeup.com. Again, hope you like it. Check it out. All right, everyone. Welcome back to Local SEO Tactics. Jesse Long with Bob Brennan, as always. And uh, this week we got a special guest. We've got Nathan Hirsch on from freeup.com. Uh, thanks for joining us, Nate. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah. So we wanted to bring Nate on because we get into a lot of topics on the show about uh, things that you guys in the uh, local service businesses can do to help you get found in Google, to improve, improve your uh, search rankings and improve your websites. And uh, as a local service business, a small business, you get pretty damn busy doing a lot of stuff and you just can't be Superman doing everything. Uh, so we wanted to bring Nate on. Uh, Nate's got a great story. Um, kind of starting from $20 in his dorm room to yeah. building a multi-million dollar business. Cool. Um, yeah, and a, and a great adventure along the way. So we're going to uh, talk to Nate a little bit about that, kind of where he came from, where he's going, um, and then get into uh, where FreeUp can actually help all you guys out there to, to grow your business, to offload some of this stuff, and uh, kind of hopefully take some parallel journeys for, for what Nate's done in, uh, in growing things. So, um, so with that, Nate, um, we were saying right before we started recording here, I love in your bio that blurb you have about you've never had a real job besides being a high school intern at Aaron's. But I kind of find that's a little ironic being that you also have in there, you did a bootstrapping as a $20 student, basically over the course of was it about nine years to $30 million on Amazon. So that's kind of a real job in a sense too, right? I mean, back then people thought I was crazy. They definitely didn't think it was a real job. I mean, Amazon, this was back in 2008, 2009. So there were no gurus, there were no courses. Um, no one really knew what Amazon was. And um, it, was, it was kind of a crazy time. Right. So, I mean, going back, my parents were both teachers. I always grew up with the mentality that I was going to go out, get into a good college, work for four years, get a degree, maybe an internship, lead to a job, work for 50 years, retire. And that was going to be my life in the town next to me. It was a very rich town. All the, all the kids, their parents were doctors, lawyers, dentists, business owners, and we weren't broke, but my parents were both teachers. So we were okay um, in terms of being uh, middle class. So during the summer, I was always forced to work these summer jobs, 40 hours a week. I worked at errands. I worked at a Firestone Corporation. Well, all my friends were outside playing, enjoying the summer, and I hated every second of it. And I was always watching the clock. I didn't like listening to authority. I didn't want to work for other people. But I learned so much about sales, about customer service, about managing people. And when I got to college, I almost looked at it like a ticking clock. If I didn't figure out how to start a business by the time I graduated, I was going to be miserable for the next 50 years. So when I got to college, I started hustling, trying every little thing to make money. I started buying and selling people's textbooks, competing with the school bookstore. I created a little referral program. Before I knew it, I had lines out the door of people trying to sell me their textbooks to the point where I actually got a cease and desist letter from my school telling me to knock it off because I was dealing too much of the business. So that was kind of my first glimpse into being an entrepreneur. And I mentioned selling books led me to Amazon. Amazon was pretty new. I just had to figure out what products to sell because I saw the potential. I thought it was so cool. I could have this 24 seven store, but I had to figure out what I could sell long term because I knew I was going to graduate at some point. Books were not the answer for me. So I started experimenting. I, I try 
outdoor products, DVDs, video games, computers, products I'm pretty familiar with. And I just fail over and over and over again. And the only thing that I can get to sell were these damn books. And it wasn't until I branched out of my comfort zone and came across this deal on a baby product that I found a niche that I could sell a lot of. So if you can imagine me as a 20 year old single college guy selling baby products on Amazon, that was me. My computer was just tabs and tabs of baby products. People who would look over my shoulder thought I was crazy. <laughs> But I would just spend nine hours a day just researching it and listing these products. And this business scaled, it's growing. I, I finally feel like, okay, I should probably start paying taxes. So I meet with an accountant for the first time. And the first question he asked me is, when are you gonna hire your first person? And I kind of shrug him off. I'm like, why would I do that? The money's going into my pocket. I don't wanna pay someone else. I can work seven days a week. No one can do it as well as I can, blah, 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 excuses. And he just laughed in my face. <laughs> and he pretty much said, you're gonna learn this lesson on your own. <laughs> well, sure enough, my first busy season comes around and I'm not prepared for busy season. I have no idea what busy season is. And I get destroyed. And I'm working 20 hours a day, balancing school, balancing my business, my social life goes down the tube. And I make it out to January somehow. And I think to myself, I can never let this happen again. And I make a quick hire, this guy in my business law class, Connor, who ends up being awesome. And I eventually make him my business partner. So I'm thinking hiring's easy. You put up a job, you take, a, you take some resumes, you hire someone. Well, I proceed to make bad hire after bad hire after bad hire. And I quickly realized that hiring college kids, not reliable. No 30-year-old expert wants to work for me. I'm 21. So I turned to the remote hiring world where I have a lot of success but it also just takes so much time to post a job on Upwork, Fiverr, and I wanted a better way, a faster marketplace, some way to get access to talent quickly, and that's when I came up with the idea of free up. So that's how I went from a broke college kid to starting two companies. Pretty good, right? Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. I'd like, like to follow that. Um, <laughs> well, I think you're, you're speaking there, kind of that Superman mentality of like you're saying, like, I can do this, I can do this better than anyone, why do I need help? Um, that delegation part is, it's way more challenging than people yeah. give it credit for, right? I mean, you just you feel like you can and should do everything. So um, it's definitely pretty tricky. We can obviously speak to that as well. So um, for for the local business owner, so the talent at freeup.com, it's it's global, right? You're not just talking here in the U.S. You're not just talking in the Philippines or in India. Um, it's all across the world, correct? Yeah, we're about 40% U.S., 40% Philippines, and 20% scattered, not necessarily yeah. by design. I mean, we get thousands of applicants every week, and we're letting in the best of the best, regardless of where they're located. And that's what I was going to ask, too. You say on your, your website, it's the top 1%. So what is, uh, you know, what is your vetting process? If somebody's out there kind of nervous about, you know, again, hey, I'm Superman or Superwoman. I can do all this better than anybody. How can I or why should I trust somebody else? You know, you're in that top 1%. You guys aren't just letting any Joe Schmo uh, come in here and do this kind of stuff. What's, what, what's the vetting process like for you? Yeah, so we really do let in one out of every 100 applicants. Um, we vet them on not only skill, but for attitude and communication as well. So when we're talking about skill, it doesn't necessarily matter if you're a 3 out of 10, a 7 out of 10, a 10 out of 10, as long as you're priced accordingly. But most importantly, you're honest about what you can and you cannot do. I mean, that's really the key to keeping clients happy is freelancers only taking tickets or freelancer requests that they can do at a very high level. So for skill, we're looking for, or we have different skill tests that we came up with. If you're an Amazon expert, you get asked questions. If you're a graphic designer, we look at your portfolio. If you're a developer, we have dev tests that you take. So the skill's different. The attitude and the communication is the same regardless of your skill set. So for attitude, we're doing one-on-one -on -one interviews. We're looking for people who are passionate about what they do. They're not just in it for the paycheck. If I hate bookkeeping, which I'm sure you guys hate bookkeeping too, if I hire a bookkeeper, they have to love bookkeeping as much as I love being an entrepreneur. Those are the type of people we look for, people who want to be part of community, people who care about their clients. That's what we want. Um, for communication, communication's everything. Even if you two are sitting right next to each other, communication's important. Never mind working with someone across the world. So. Well, for us, we have 15 pages of communication best practices that freelancers have to memorize and get tested on before they get on the platform. Um, and I wrote those myself based on my own bad communication experiences. Um, so that's what it takes to get in. 
in terms of the mentality, I mean, if you think of it just logically, how many $5 million a year solo business owners are there? Not that many. You, if you want to get to the next level, you have to hire. It's the only way up. At some point, you're going to hit that wall, hit that ceiling. And yes, there's going to be risk. Any part of business has risk. Even if you hire your best friend to sit right next to you, there's always a chance they do something stupid to jeopardize your business in some way. But the risk is a lot smaller than people think. I've been doing this for eight years. I've never had an issue. We build 13,000 hours a week. Never had an issue. I'm sure if we build enough hours, eventually something will happen because that's life. But these freelancers care a lot more about getting more clients and staying in our network and, and building their track record and their revenue streams than they do about jeopardizing your business in any way. So uh, for these freelancers, how, what's the typical duration on when somebody contracts them? Is it ongoing or is there, uh, does it work like with a predefined amount of time like per job or per project or, or both even? Yeah, I mean, we have clients that have hired three full-time customer service reps in the Philippines, and they've had them for the past three years. And then we have a client who will hire someone for a graphic design project and hire them one time and never talk to them again. Or maybe they keep a PPC expert in their back pocket, and they go to them here and there. I mean, it, you can kind of use it part-time, full-time, one-time, roll, keep them in your Rolodex, whatever makes sense. And, and that's kind of the beauty of the gig economy that we live in right now. I mean, before you had to hire experts for $150,000 a year, or you had to commit to a certain amount of hours. I mean, there's so much flexibility to hire people that fit your needs. So and as a business owner, um, let's say if I'm doing that role where I'm just kind of using somebody on a spot basis, not hiring them, you know, full time and, and for three years. Um, maybe can you speak to the free ups dashboard? Like, is it easy for me to come back in six months later and see if that same person is available for another job? Or how yeah. does that work? So you're communicating with the freelancer directly. There's no messaging in our software as of right now, um, but you have that person's email, their phone number, their Skype ID. You can use Slack. You can use Google Hangouts. So you communicate with the freelancer however you want. The freelancers are required to respond within one business day at all times. That doesn't necessarily mean they can get your project within one business day, but you at least get a response. And if you reach out to someone after six months, the most likely scenario is they'll say, yeah, no problem. I just have to wrap X, Y, Z up. I can start on this date, have it done by X date. And worst case scenario, they're like, you know what? I am swamped. Let me send you back to Nate and he'll get you another option. Okay. So what kind of protection or, you know, policing, if you will, do you guys provide? If let's say we, we engage with a freelancer um, and we say this, this is not what we, what we wanted, even though it's top 1%, maybe we're just dissatisfied, right? For some reason. Um, what kind of guarantees do you have? Or maybe that's not the right word guarantees, but you know, what kind of protections to give me confidence? I've never done this before. If I'm in Kansas, like, I don't know who I'm going to hire through this, this service. You know what I mean? Where's this going? Uh, what kind of fail safes do you have? Definitely. So, I mean, you are using freelancers at your own risk there. There's always going to be that risk. There's nothing I can do to make that risk zero in terms of satisfaction. I mean, it's in our best interest to get you people that you like. You could, there's no sign up fee, there's no monthly fee, there's no minimum, there's no obligation. You can stop using us at any time. It, we want to keep you happy. So if that does happen, we'll give you some credit, we'll get you someone else, we'll figure out what that issue was. I mean, sometimes there's just a personal taste preference. I mean, even the best freelancers in the world aren't the best fit for every single client in the world. And if that sure. happens, we're much more interested in having a long-term relationship with you than making a quick buck off you. That's really not what we want. Um, the other protection we have is a no turnover guarantee. So if a freelancer quits in the middle of your project for any reason, we cover all replacement costs and get you a new person right away. So um, rarely happens. It is real life. It could. These are real people, um, but it's there to protect you. You know, what, it, what I like about your model, Nate, is uh, we work with, with different clients and some of which are telling us, knock off, you know, no more marketing. We don't need any more marketing. Uh, we can't hire enough people to do the work. And that's the economy we live in. I think it's one of the lowest uh, unemployment rates we've had in almost nine years. And that being said, the talent simply isn't there, yeah. sometimes in that local market. And what's beautiful about your model is that may not be the situation in Oklahoma. It may not be the situation in the Philippines. It may not be the situation in India or whatever the case is. And there's, there's talent ready to go and sometimes better talent. Yeah. They just plug into your system and they're boom, they're ready to go. And we've had good luck with 
with um, in the past, you know, we've we've used VAs and whatnot. We're we're looking forward to working with you too, uh, coming up here in the in the near future. But but ultimately, you know, you're you've got you're in the right place at the right time, I think, with your business with yeah. this economy, at least here in the United States. Yeah. I mean, hiring locally is tough. Not only are you trying to land that perfect person, but you're also competing with all the other businesses for that same talent. And right. even if you get someone, it's just a matter of time until someone can offer them more money or more benefits or a better situation. And if you look at it from the freelancer side, it's kind of cool for them too, because they're, they're no, they no longer have that one revenue stream where if they get fired, they're out. They can have a diversified portfolio of clients where if someone stops or comes back or whatever, right. they have other people ready to go. So it works really well on both sides. Who doesn't like working out of their pajamas and not having to drive to work every day? There's other perks like that. Um, but it really protects both sides, the business owner and the freelancer. Yeah, and then depending on your culture, you know, the, sometimes, again, certain certain areas of the world, the, let's face it, the work ethic is 3x of what it is maybe in North America or sure. or uh, you know, Cincinnati or whatever, not to pick on Cincinnati, but you get the idea. I mean, it, it's, it's pretty exciting. I guess the question I have for you is, uh, can you tell us where, where your service doesn't work in a sense that, you know, somebody, there's going to be a small business owner out there expecting a, just a panacea of incredible things and their expectations are going to be way bigger than, than what you can deliver. I mean, can you speak to that where, where things disconnect typically with a service like yours? Sure. So there's three different levels of people you can hire. And this is more of a real life thing than a free up thing. So you got basic level, five to 10 bucks an hour, non-US. When you think of outsourcing, they're there to follow your systems, your processes. If you don't have those in place, you're going to really struggle to hire those people. Then you got the mid-level, that 10 to 30 range. These people are specialists. They do the same thing eight to 10 hours a day. They're graphic designers, writers, bookkeepers. They're there to do that one thing. You're not teaching them how to be a graphic designer, but they're not consulting with you either. They're doers. And then you got the experts, the 25 and up. These are people who can consult. They can project manage. They can help create systems and processes. They can execute high level game plans. They could be an agency. So with that, where people fall into the trap is when they try to hire people for the wrong level, they hire, try to hire a mid-level person to follow their instructions, or they try to hire a basic level person and say, hey, run my Facebook ads, and then it blows up in their face, and they wonder why. So half of the issues can just be resolved just by hiring that correct level of person, people. So if you're coming in thinking that for five bucks an hour, you're going to get a top expert in the Philippines who's just going to crush it and take your business to the next level, that, that is unrealistic expectations for free up. Yeah, that's good. Good question. Good points. Um, for if somebody again is just a complete novice hearing this and saying, I, "I'd like to not be Superman anymore. I want to get started here." Um, how do you help them kind of discern that and set those expectations and pick from the right pool to not not fail, you know, on their own right away? Do you have is there some resources, some self help? Is there some kind of a coach they can contact through your service? How, how does that work? So there's not a coach, but we're there to help along the way. I have a team of VAs that cover my Skypes and emails 24 seven. They're always here to help. Um, they've gone through my hiring process. They understand what it takes to be successful. Um, we have the free up blog. We have the free up YouTube channel. We're constantly posting content. If you've never hired before, I recommend to focus on building your hiring process and focus on the process more than the results because no one has a 100% hiring record. It just, it doesn't exist. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to learn from them. But what you can do is you can focus on the process. Hey, someone good got through your process. What did they say during the interview so we can look for more people like you? What If someone does, gets through and they're not a fit, hey, what new questions can we add to make sure that, they, that the next person that comes through is better? So I like to say there's a five-step hiring process where step one is you figure out what you want to take off your plate. Are you figuring out how to get hours in your day back and giving people stuff off your to-do list? Or are you turning weaknesses into strengths and hiring those mid-level and expert level people to do things that you're not very good at? Then step two is, what does that perfect person look like? Are they an employee inside the office? Are they a part-time freelancer? Is it one-time project? What skill set? What budget? What kind of availability? All that stuff. Really define what your perfect person looks like. Step three, we kind of talked about interviewing for not only skill, but attitude and communication as well. Step four is setting those expectations, which is the part that everyone messes up on. And if you do have a bad experience hiring, 
Go back to those expectations because getting on the same page right from the beginning before anything starts is going to save you a lot of time and energy down the line. And then step five is that feedback loop. Hey, instead of just saying go off on your own for a month, work for a few hours. Let me give you some feedback. Work a little more. Here's more feedback, especially with freelancers who have lots of different clients all telling them different things. So if you can follow that five-step process and tweak it to fit your own needs and build it and make it better and better and better over time, that's how you have success long-term hiring. Yeah, I think it's solid, yeah. solid advice. <clears throat> um, whether it be somebody you're hiring locally or in your case with free up, um, kind of going virtual with that, it's, I think that speaks well to, to both ends. So um, again, I'm, I'm peppering you with questions kind of from that novice. So again, if somebody's hearing this for the first time, getting intrigued, but not really knowing where to go. Um, is there is there an area, um, you've worked with lots of businesses, that is kind of an easy, quick win? Um, you know, trying not to be that Superman or Superwoman. Accounting, back end, on the marketing. Um, again, our audience, what we speak to is mainly local service businesses, uh, providing you know their services or products just in a local metro area. Um, is there something that's kind of easy to outsource if they're feeling overwhelmed? Anything you can recommend there? Yeah, I mean, customer service and bookkeeping and data entry work is obviously the go-to, but I would argue that getting a lead generation team that's just running in the background is the best investment that you can make long-term. For hiring someone five bucks an hour in the Philippines, you can have them target suppliers, you can have them target influencers, potential clients or customers or leads, and you can have them reaching out, whether it's LinkedIn or social media or finding their email on their website and split testing with different sales pitches. I posted an article on my um, social media recently of, of my eight-step lead generation process. And it's not rocket science. You set it up. It takes some tweaking. It's like any other form of sales. It's a 90-plus percent. Either they don't respond to a rejection rate, but you're constantly get, getting new leads in. And over time, you'll get it to the point where new leads are, are flowing in without you really doing anything. We, some of our best clients we've gotten from that, some of the best podcasts we've been on we've gotten from that, our best influencers, our best partners, just because in the background, we have this very affordable lead generation team that could cost you five bucks a day. It could cost you a hundred bucks a day if you want to make a big investment or, or anything in between. And over time, that's going to lead to a lot of great relationships and opportunities for you. Sure. Thank you. That's great. Great answer. Yeah. Like yeah. Who, who couldn't use more, more lead generation, right. more sales, right? Um, regardless of what your, your exact need is. So, but the key there, I just want to throw this in. You've got to have a process. You can't just yeah. say, here, go do this. You've got to have a script ready for them. You've got to have, you know, yeah. some idea or a plan for them to run in. Which one execute? You execute first for, let's say, a couple hours or 20 hours until you've got it refined. And then hand it over to your, your free up staff. Right. Does that sound like a plan? I mean. Yeah. I'm kind of at the advanced stage of hiring where I like to figure stuff out with my virtual assistant. So I'll okay. hire them and I'll, I'll kind of have them go and I'll, I'll kind of do that feedback loop with them where we're okay. trying different things together. Do I advise that someone who's never hired a VA before to do that? Probably not. And you should probably do it yourself and come up with those systems and processes. But depending on where you are in your business, you can really play around with it. I like to say focus on low risk, high reward situations. I, I just told you one with the lead gen team. Here's another example. I just hired someone to run my Instagram. It's going to cost 200 bucks a month. What's the worst case scenario? I hire them for Three months, it cost me $600. That sucks, but it's not the end of the world, and I put right. my time and money towards something else. What's the best case scenario? They grow my brand, they get me clients, it's already happening, and it's one less thing I have to deal with, and they're doing it way better than I can. So if you're right. constantly focusing on those low-risk, high-reward situations, not all of them are going to work, but you can pull back on what's not working and invest more into what's working because – there's so many different ways to promote your business, whether it's LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, you could go on and on. And what works for one business doesn't necessarily work for another. So if you're in that startup stage and you're not trying lots of different things to figure out what works the best for your business, what is the fastest ROI, you're really missing out on a lot of opportunity. I like a couple of things I said there. Um, you know, one for delegation, it's always, you know, from what we believe at least, get rid of things off your plate that you don't want to do, you know, or, or that you're just not good at. Right. Uh, so something like, like you said, going after the Instagram deal, you're hiring somebody there to replace you. You're probably not super good at it or you don't want to do it. But to what point you said earlier, the person that you're going to hire to do that, 
is an expert at it, right? So their talent is way better than yours position to do that. Um, and then the second part that I thought was pretty interesting is, like I so said, you can try this for a few months. If you're gonna hire, just hire somebody locally, you're talking 20 to 40 hours, you know, you gotta make their payroll. Yep. Um, are they gonna have 20 to 40 hours a week of Instagram stuff to do? What else am I gonna put on their plates? You know, and, and just so many stuff with this. Um, you can try it for a little bit, set your budget, like you said, accordingly. And then if it works, you can pour more gas on the fire, right? And, and just accelerate it from there. So um, that's pretty that's pretty cool advice. I like that. Thanks. And one of the one of the best activities my partner Connor and I did back in the day, where our business was growing for a while, then we started to step on each other's toes. We couldn't figure out what to do next. Is we sat outside on a balcony and for an hour we just went back and forth, brutally honest. You're bad at this. <laughs> and we called each other out on it, and we wrote okay, every marriage. Down. Yeah, it, it was like a marriage. It's like couples therapy. Um, so at the end of it, we realized, okay, we complement each other very well. We make great business partners. Awesome. But then we also realized that we had this whole list of things that we were both bad at, yet we were just doing them every single week. So we started to hire people, specialists or experts, to turn those weaknesses into strengths. And that's what really accelerated our business to the next level. And ever since then, we've been doing that activity every quarter. I was just in Colorado hiking with him and on the way up the mountain we were talking about the exact same thing and, and and if you're able to do that with yourself with your business with your team with your business partners you can have a lot of success you can identify those weaknesses and hire freelancers or hire people to turn those weaknesses into strength right that's what it's all about again delegation is, is getting everybody stronger focusing on what you're good at um, and what you're passionate about um, you know so you can achieve and grow so yeah so yeah, cool. business owner you get the vision Right. And it's your job to align everybody in with that vision. Right. If you don't have a vision, well, then, you know, go get a job. But basically, that's, this is a great tool for all that. Right. No, I mean, one quick thing or two quick things. If you go to freeup.com with three E's, my calendar is right at the top. If anyone wants to book a meeting with me, um, you can also create a free account. Mention this podcast, get a $25 credit added to your account to try to set out risk-free um, and yeah, I really appreciate, appreciate you having me on and I look forward to helping your community with their hiring needs. You know, I'm just thinking, uh, rewind too. I had one question you brought up earlier. We're focusing here on how to, how to delegate, you know, how to free up your time. Uh, this is a two way conduit you got too, right? I mean, if somebody is interested in, in joining, uh, be a service provider or what is your, your exact term is, uh, I imagine they can jump on too. Yeah, you can apply right on the website. We're always looking for talented people. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll be in contact for our own needs, too. You can, you can bet on that. So. Awesome. Looking forward to working with you guys. All right. See you, Thanks, Nate. Take care. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed that interview with Nate. Some great tips in there. Uh, some great lessons on how to delegate and free yourself up. And uh, if you haven't done it, go check out his website. As he says in there, you can throw some pretty small money at this to see if it works. Test it out. And if you like that, like we say, it's crawl, walk, run. Um, Take it to the next level, throw a little more at it, maybe hire a little more talent, and uh, just continue to supplement your own business with uh, great talent, specialists, and, and get on with the work that you want to do. So um, check that out. Let's get into our five-star review of the week. This week, we got a great five-star review from Superfood Adventures. It goes on to say, this podcast has great info for entrepreneurs. The guys give practical info on topics that can be confusing. Thanks, guys. Keep up the good work. Appreciate the five-star review. Uh, that's the kind of feedback that we love to get. Let's us know we're on the right track. We'd love to hear from all you guys out there. If you're finding benefit in this and value in our podcast, we hope we're helping. Um, go to intrix.com slash iTunes. That'll take you to iTunes where you can leave a review. You can just leave us a five-star rating or whatever it is. Uh, and if you want to put some text behind it to communicate to us, we'd love to hear that too. And we'll read it on the show. If you do have other ideas you want us to talk about, questions you want to ask, or anything that you need help with, go to intrix.com slash show. And you can also reach out to us there. Love to hear from you. And until then, see you next week.